All right. Hi, guys. So let's begin here. We're going to be doing, or I'm going to be doing, because no one's here, um, a uh, lab mini lecture on this week's lab, which is our enzyme lab, uh, lab enzyme action. Uh, this is a two week lab. So two parts and they take two weeks, meaning this week is part one, okay? Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, <clears throat> and as I wrote on the board here, the goal this week, this will make a lot more sense in about 15 or so minutes. The goal for week one is to determine optimal saliva dilution. Saliva, yes, that's what I said, <laughs> uh, for next week. So we're going to be determining, determining an optimal uh, dilution factor, a dilution factor, and the, our optimal or best one. That's the goal this week. So we're going to be going over uh, how we set up this lab, and we're going to have these different dilution factors. And by the end of the lab, we end up with uh, an optimal dilution factor. That's the goal. And I'll teach you what that means and how we get that. Uh, so that's the goal. Uh, to be honest, this is a little strange. Not just the lab, it's, it is a strange lab. <laughs> we use saliva. Of course, that wouldn't be appropriate during these times, but um, it's a fun lab uh, in person. We're um, looking at the enzyme present in our spit, our saliva, that breaks down starch, that breaks down uh, food, uh, more specifically starch, uh, that we find in grains, corn, potatoes. Uh, and so uh, I was going to say, basically, it's, it's a little strange, though, that Miracosta has this lab before the microscope lab. I'm not sure why it is. Uh, I don't, you know, come up with the lab schedule and it's fine. I just kind of have to give you some more background on enzymes because really how the textbook is ordered and how the lecture schedule is even ordered for Miracosta and it's universal for all the instructors for Bio 110. Uh, we teach about enzymes after cells and after um, cells and organelles, which, which aligns with the microscopes, which is the lab after enzymes. Uh, and then at that point, I teach about enzymes in lecture. So it's flipped, and I don't know why. But it's cool. I'm just going to give you a little more info on enzymes. Uh, very brief, um, nothing too crazy. And talk about the lab. This is kind of a weird, complicated lab. Uh, I had to really prepare and uh, you know, remember how to set it up. Uh, but it's really interesting, and I think you guys will enjoy the concepts at least. I wish, I, of course, I always say I wish we were doing this in person, but we adapt. We adapt, we carry on. Carry on, yeah, okay. So uh, <laughs> let's see, what did I want to do first? Uh, um, I think we should first talk about enzymes. What are enzymes? What do they do? What is their purpose? What is their role in our cells? Uh, and then we'll look at the specific enzyme reaction going on in this lab that we're investigating. Uh, so let's, let's begin. Let's just begin with that. Okay, so keep this brief on enzymes. I did hit record, right? Yeah. Okay. So enzymes, at least 99% of enzymes are proteins. And we did learn that because we just talked about biological molecules. You're taking your exam today on biological molecules. And we discussed that uh, enzymes fall under this category of proteins. Enzymes are proteins. Yes, I said 99% because 
a Nobel Prize winner discovered that there are a few enzymes that aren't proteins and it was actually so astonishing and beautiful work that she won the Nobel Prize. Uh, so there are a few ribozymes made of nucleic acid, <laughs> but you don't have to know that. Uh, for our purposes, and 99% of enzymes are proteins. Okay, so what are enzymes? Enzymes are catalysts of chemical reactions. So I'm going to write enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. And what I mean by catalyze is really it allows them to proceed. It allows them to happen. I actually do recall mentioning, uh, I hope I mentioned, um, breaking down lactose when we talked about hydrolysis and we broke it apart. That's a chemical reaction and you need an enzyme to catalyze that chemical reaction. You need an enzyme to, uh, to cause it to happen. Uh, otherwise, it would never happen. That's the key. These enzymes, uh, and when we talk about enzymes in the lecture and get in depth, we're going to talk about really how they do this. Uh, but for today and for this lab, I want you to know that enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. They really, they speed them up um, more specifically because if enzymes were not present, let's say lactose being broken apart with the enzyme used uh, lactase is the enzyme. Um, if lactase is not present, lactose would take, I think they've estimated, I don't know, thousands of years, billion, maybe millions of years for it to break apart. Uh, enzymes are crucial for chemical reactions to occur in the cell. And of course, we can't wait that long. We need metabolic processes to occur. We need to be building molecules uh, and breaking them apart. Um, and yes, that sort of thing. Okay, let's see. So um, let's talk about the specific enzymatic reaction occurring in this lab. I mentioned starch and I mentioned, mentioned an enzyme in our saliva, okay? So we do start with starch. We do start with starch, which we learned was a, and here's the picture in the lab. And we learned it's that stored sugar in plants, it's the uh, polysaccharide, it's a very large, macromolecule, okay, uh, carbohydrate. And um, so I'm going to write, let's write uh, starch, why not? <laughs> so we have a starch molecule, and maybe I'll represent it with some glucose uh, rings that are covalently bound together. Keep in mind, this is, this, this is much longer chains of glucose, right? From a thousand, a few hundred to a few thousand. And with any chemical reaction, we have a reaction arrow, right? And in this reaction, our enzyme in our saliva, it's a digestive enzyme. And it's called amylase. And whenever we have an enzyme in a chemical reaction, we write it on top of the reaction arrow. So I'm going to write amylase here. Now, the starch there are two really starch molecules that, are, uh, that we know of. And one of them is actually called amylose. Uh, kind of like, you know, how glucose and lactose, these are carbohydrates. So amylase is actually working on the more, more specifically, starch is kind of the common name. It's amylose, uh, but that's, that's why it's called amylase. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so what amylase is doing is it's going to catalyze the reaction where we break starch apart. 
Um, and it's actually a hydrolysis reaction. So I kind of screwed up. I got to add water, don't I? So we learned that in hydrolysis, that you, you can add water and with a enzyme that is, uh, we call them hydrolytic enzymes, uh, they hydrolyze the starch. They, and by hydrolyzing it, it breaks it apart, as we learned in hydrolysis. So amylase is a hydrolytic enzyme. All of our digestive enzymes are hydrolytic. And they're going to hydrolyze the starch molecule. And imagine it's this long chain uh, with amylase and water, it's going to break off a piece of the starch. Uh, and so let's write, I'm actually just going to write starch. Um, actually, why not? I'll just add two more here. Sort of ran out of room. But the concept here is that with amylase, we're going to break off a piece of this starch. More specifically, we break two off. Uh, a disaccharide can come off, and we call it, it's called malt, maltose. Um, so let's write. Here's our maltose. It's two glucose monosaccharides covalently linked together. This is our maltose. And then of course we have the rest of our starch. So if I broke off two in this hypothetical starch, we have three left. I'll just write that up here. One, two. This is really bad looking, <laughs> but okay. All right. So this can only happen in the presence of our amylase protein. Okay, cool. Now, what do I want to talk about next? Now that we know that, <laughs> get my notes out here. Um, misplaced it. Here it is. <clears throat> All right, so on to the lab. So this is this kind of conceptual part. What are enzy what enzymes do uh, causes this reaction to occur by speeding it up, and we get the breakdown of starch. Now, this next part is kind of strange, but. Uh, let me get my guide here. Okay, perfect. So let's go ahead and erase this. Now, I mentioned the goal of this lab is to ter determine this optimal dilution factor. So we set up a serial dilution. Uh, this is under part one. It might be a different page. Uh, mine, for mine, it's page three, but this is under serial dilution to determine optimal amylase activity. Now, okay. I'm gonna set up five, test tubes for this serial dilution. Five test tubes. I'm going to do it up here for a reason. So one, two, three, four, five test tubes. And each test tube, I'm going to add two milliliters of water. So two mLs of H2O in each test tube. Okay, 
is enough. Okay. Now, in this lab, I say it's weird because what you do <clears throat> is we would, uh, one student in your lab group would volunteer. I mentioned saliva, so we got to work with saliva. <laughs> and they would spit into a separate test tube, not one of these. A stock saliva, we would call it a conical tube. So I can even draw it over here um, in a separate skinnier tube. This is where our stock saliva is. So they would, you know, uh, they would create this stock tube and if I remember correctly, uh, let's see. Oh, four. Okay. Yeah, you'd have like four milliliters of the stock saliva. And what what you're gonna do, so let's we start had the four, right? Four mils. To do this, what we call a serial dilution, where we dilute uh, solutions serially, one after the other. Uh, you, you would start by creating a one to two dilution. And this is our dilution factor. A one to two uh, dilution factor of saliva. We are diluting our pure saliva, okay? It's pure four mils, right? And to get a one to two, where one part saliva, two parts, actually the, the whole volume of the solution, and I'll explain that in a moment, you're going to take with a transfer pipette, you're going to transfer two milliliters of the saliva from the stock into that first tube. Okay. So then you're going to have, right, two mils saliva in here and two milliliters water. There's your four milliliters total volume. And so you have two mils of saliva four over four total volume that reduced is one to two when it comes to saliva to the whole volume of your solution. And so from there, with your transfer pipette, you take another two milliliters after thoroughly mixing this and transferring it into this tube. This creates a one to four dilution. And then again, same thing, two milliliters. And that'll be one to eight. Two mils, you get one to 16. And lastly, two mils to get uh, one to 32 dilution of saliva. And again, after this, the goal is going to be determining which one of these diluted saliva tubes is going to be considered your optimal uh, tube for next week, part two of the lab. What do I mean by optimal? We'll take a look at that shortly. Okay. Now I drew this up here because for the experiment, we're sort of setting it up for the actual experiment here. And we've got to add it to starch, right? We got, we got to add our uh, saliva to the starch in order to start breaking it down. Remember, the amylase is in our saliva. So we're actually, I don't know if I mentioned this, but we start to digest our food in our mouth. Um, so, uh, I'm going to set up 
some more test tubes for the experimental. So these are the dilutions. And then for the actual experiment, I'm going to set up some more test tubes here corresponding to each of these test tubes. How many is it? Five? One, two, three, four, five. OK. And in each of these test tubes for our experiment, I'm going to add two milliliters of starch, two mils of the starch, which is a liquid in our lab. I'm going to add two mils to each one. Then I'm also going to add two mils of buffer solution. I actually forget why that is. I think it's because the enzyme is slightly acidic. Maybe it affects the rate of reaction. I have to, it doesn't matter yet. Well, maybe there's a question on it, but um, I don't know why you add the buffer. It just tells you to. Um, hmm. Well, if it asks about it, then I'll certainly look into it. But for our purposes, we don't have to know why. Buffers, by the way, are compounds that uh, resist changes in pH. So say I drink coffee, it's a little acidic, uh, and it enters my blood. Uh, the acidic uh, hydrogen ions from that coffee. Um, I have a buffer in my blood called bicarbonate that the pancreas secretes uh, that actually neutralizes the hydrogen ions so that uh, the, the pH will not change. It'll absorb those hydrogen ions uh, and become a neutral compound that won't affect pH. So that's what a buffer does. So something must play with the pH, probably the saliva. It has to be. Anyways, I'm going on a tangent. <laughs> You're going to add the buffer as well. So it's two milliliters of this pH 7 buffer to each tube. Two mils buffer, abbreviate buff. Two mils buffer, two mil buff and two mil buff. Obviously, this is not drawn to scale up here. Be towards the bottom of our test tube. OK. This next part is slightly tricky. Slightly tricky. All right. Slightly tricky because there's one more thing I'm going to draw here. It's called a 96 well plate. Okay. 96 well plates because I'm not going to draw all the wells, but let me uh, go ahead. So it's about this big. This is probably, this is actually a pretty good representative size of one of these plates. Uh, and it's like a, a plastic plate and it has 96 little wells in it. And my math is terrible right now, but I forget how many are across and down, but essentially there's 96 of them. <laughs> That's all that matters. Okay, looks something like that. A bunch of little wells. Uh, I do know that there are more than four rows because each row in our well plate is going to correspond, and I, there's probably seven or so, I believe, seven rows, and we need only five rows. So each row is going to correspond to our, one of our test tubes here in our experiment. So let's say this is test tube one, test tube two, test tube three, test tube four, test tube five. Each row, so this will be the row for test tube one corresponding to one, to two, and so on, okay? We have up to five, I only drew four, but you get the idea. 
I'm actually move this up a little bit. Okay. The next thing I want to do, we're kind of, we're priming everything. We're setting it all up for this reaction. It's important because in this experiment, timing is a thing. But the next thing we're going to do is in each one of these wells, I'm going to add uh, a reagent that should sound familiar from last week's lab. Uh, and it's going to be uh, Lugol's solution. Now, oh, my, okay, I just read in the lab. So it's 12, 12 wells per row. There's 12 of these. So 12 times something is 96, and that's how many go down. Not, I don't teach math, so it's cool. <laughs> All right. So um, now I want to know. 12, is it 12, 8? Are there 8 rows? 12 times 8, 96, whatever. All right. So in each of the rows, we use a micro pipette that pipettes 100 microliters each time you uh, push down on the plunger. Uh, and we're going to pipette 100 microliters of Lugol's. Now remember Lugol's, really quick reminder, in our biological molecules lab, it's important, um, Lugol's reagent was a pale yellow. I don't have yellow, but I have this orange. Pretend it's a pale yellow. And it was used to detect starch, right? And the yellow would turn to that very dark bluish black, right, in the presence of starch. It's important. What we're going to do is add 100 microliters of Lugol's in each one of these wells. I'm not going to do all of them. Since we only use five rows, you would only fill the first five rows, right? So on, you have the, um, I'll leave that actually blank for a specific reason. Um, okay, so pretend I just filled in all my rows with Lugol's. You have this grid of Lugol's. Eh, I might as well. Let's do it really quick. Quick, quick, quick. I like having the complete picture, so. All right. There it is. Uh, 100 microliters each. All right, now we're ready. Now we're ready to do the actual experiments, all right? And it's a timing thing. It's a very sensitive sort of timing thing. So this, this is what happens. Um, what you're gonna do, or watch a video on or see, is, um, This is what happens. You're gonna take, we're gonna start with this one to two dilution. In fact, to keep everything consistent, actually, no, no, no. But I drew these on top of each other for a reason because you're gonna take this one to two dilution. You can even label this as a one to two. Uh, I don't like that either. <laughs> this is the key. I've stacked them on top of each other for a reason, because in our first test tube, you're gonna take this one to two dilution that you set up and transfer out of it one milliliter and add it to that tube. Okay, so I'm gonna write one milliliter. Now, very important. The reason I didn't have you do this first and then like add the starch and the buffer, why would that be? Well, you have your enzyme in your saliva, your amylase, and you have your starch. If we were to do that, the starch and the amylase would already be interacting, even when you're like setting up your other tubes. And that's not, that's not good because this is a very, this is a time sensitive experiment. And so as soon as you transfer your enzyme in your saliva to the solution containing your starch, that enzyme is going to be catalyzed, right? 
no, reaction. The reaction is going to be catalyzed by that enzyme. That breakdown is going to start happening as soon as you transfer. And so what you do, you wait 30 seconds. You transfer, and then you wait 30 seconds. Yeah, we would have a stopwatch or your phone. And after 30 seconds, after 30 seconds, we use the 100 microliters, right? Step back here. Okay. Okay, so you wait 30 seconds and you record the total time, and I'll explain that as well, that it takes for something to happen. It, and it involves determining the optimal dilution. But you wait 30 seconds, you're timing this, you transfer it in, and after the 30 seconds, so wait 30 seconds, then uh, you're going to take 100 microliters with your, the same pipette you used for the uh, Lugols. You've replaced the tip, of course, um, uh, so that you're not cross-contaminating. And you would take 100 microliters and add it to that very first little well. You just drop it in um, after the 30 seconds. So this is going to be 100 microliters using that micro pipette. Now, this is repeating. You repeat this process. So this gets repeated, meaning after you do that, after the 30 seconds, you pipette, you wait another 30 seconds, and you take another 100 microliters, and you're going to, and then you would add it to this second well, then the third well, then the fourth well, etc. Okay, so quickly, I'll explain that you do the same exact process with the other rows, but with our other dilutions that we set up. So for one to four, you would take one mil, add it to your second test tube here, one mil of your one to four dilution saliva, add it to your second test tube, and if, again, you wait the 30 seconds for some breakdown to occur, some enzyme reaction to occur, and then you would start adding it to row number two. Okay, so it would be like 100 microliters into there, 30 seconds, repeat, repeat, repeat. Same thing for all five tubes. The 30 second process and repeat. So what are we looking for? What are we looking for? I'll show you. Let's say we're on our third or maybe, let's say we're on our third row here out of five. What are we looking for? We're looking for this. We are looking for, now let me, well, let me just quickly remind you, if starch is present, then, and Lugol's is in that solution, right? Lugol's would turn dark blue black, right? If starch is present, that means it is not being broken down into the maltose units. It's not being picked apart and broken down by this enzyme and the water, right? That hydrolytic reaction. Okay, so that means if we see pale yellow, which is no color change, it's referred to in the lab as no color change because it's still pale yellow, that means the enzyme must be working that when you add 
the it starch and the enzyme combined. That starch is being broken down. But what if I see this? I'm going to do, actually, what's optimal here? Uh, oh, 4 to 10. Never mind. OK, let me do. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm just screwing up all over the place here. I told you it's a tricky lab. And Prof Larue sometimes screws it up. So let me erase this. Okay. These would actually stay the same. Okay. Now I'm going to use this purple to indicate that there is a color change. And let's say in our third row here, well, first, let's say in our first and second row, okay, we don't see any color change at all. It's just yellow the whole time, even though we added to all the wells and we're like, okay, no starch is present, right? Otherwise you see dark blue, black. So let's say on the third row, we see dark blue, black in our wells like that, like our first four wells there. And then our fifth, sixth, seventh well and so forth, pale yellow, no color change. Now we would call that optimal. That's optimal dilution. So optimal defined in this lab of enzyme concentration, our optimal concentration is when wells between four, so this is our fourth well, right? Or after four, was it? Between four and 10, so after four. So if you have, here's the quote, optimal means no color change for three wells in a row between wells number, well number, what, what is it? Well, I'm like, look, wells, well number. Let's just say wells four through 10. <laughs> Been a long day. Wells four through 10. Okay, so th what that means is if you are looking at wells four through 10, so this is, uh, this is our fifth well. So this falls under it. I, I believe this could be optimal too if you have the fourth well do this. Uh, but besides the point, uh, between wells four through 10, if you see three in a row, as we see here, that did not change color from blue to black between wells four through 10. That's what optimal is. Okay. And you might get optimal here as well, or maybe they all turn blue and black and then there's not really much enzyme action going on at all, but that's the key. We want that. And so if, let's say for our example here that our third well or a thir third row was our optimal row. We're like, okay, no color change, three consecutive wells in a row. And these wells are between four and 10. This would be our fifth well. That means three. The optimal dilution factor would be one to eight. That's our optimal enzyme concentration. Optimal meaning the enzymes diluted enough where it takes some time before we start to see the breakdown of starch. And 
we like that. In this lab, we want that. We want, it, we want a good amount of time before starch is broken down. I believe that's all I wanted to say. Did it, I hope I didn't take too long with this mini lecture. It's, it is one of our more complex labs, that's for sure. Um, it does want you to do a graph. So you can do that hand-drawn or Excel or something, or Google Sheets if you know how to do that. Um, uh, Stacy seems to like Google Sheets. Um, so this is number eight. Uh, the graph that uh, you want to do is like this. So, well, there's no graph, but you're going to want, it's going to be categorical data, so bar graph, and it's going to be five bars for each dilution factor. And the dependent variable here is the number of wells to no color change. So for number, our first row here, really you wouldn't draw any bar because there wasn't, there wasn't a color change at all. So let's say, let's say row two had only two turn black, purple, or whatever, and then the rest were yellow. You would have two wells to no color change. Here, it's four wells to no color change. And then here it should be even more. It might be seven wells. It might be all 12. OK. And then, of course, part two is what we do next week examination of environmental influences on enzyme activity. So quite, you answer the questions and just like usual. All right. I think that's it. That's all I wanted to, all I wanted to say. Oh, you do record the total time as well for each row. Uh, and this is because, well, you're recording the total time for finding the no color change. Uh, I believe that's for the data table. For the, for the optimal, at least, for the no color change. Yeah, so you would record that under time to no color change, which is, again, just three in a row. In fact, in person, as soon as you see three in a row that don't uh, change to starch, blue, black, you can stop. The experiment because you know that the rest of them uh, there's going to be hydrolyzed starch because it's just chilling after every 30 seconds with the enzyme and starch and you're just going to keep you know the answer already you know how many wells uh, it took for that to happen if that makes sense again it's a tricky lab but that's all I wanted to say uh, yeah I'll just say one more thing. So basically, yeah, like if your first row here, like you got no color change at all, the whole thing, meaning there's so much concentrated enzyme, starch is just being broken down immediately and there's none present. Um, the time to no color change is basically zero. There, there was no color change at all. And then if row two, like the first well was blue, black, the second well was blue, black, then it, all the rest, it'd be about a minute, right? Because each one is 30 seconds. Okay, that's it. All right, so I hope that helps and uh, hope your week's going well. Um, let me know if you have questions, as always, shoot me an email. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the synchronous section. I'll see you Thursday. We are beginning our next unit. We're gonna be talking about cells and fun stuff. All right.